It's been a very interesting period uh, that we face. Uh, as I've indicated, uh, Pontius Machila and I were the first two black attorneys. He started the year before, when, when, when the uprising started in 1976. He started practice there. And then I joined him in 1977. And we were, we were really brothers. So, I mean, we helped each other because, you know, at that time when we started practice in Rustenburg, two things you, I could, I, that, that I could recollect. If you were an attorney, a black attorney, you could not sit on the chair in the prosecutor's office. You had to stand, discuss your business and go. When they adjourn for tea, the whites are allowed to go for tea, but Pontius Machila and I were not invited. In Conversation With is proudly sponsored by Africa Cash and Carry, Crown Mines, and shot on location at Cortuba Convention Center. In Conversation With CII, today we're in conversation with Enver Surti previously Deputy Minister of Basic Education, Minister of Justice, one of the most senior South African Muslim leaders to serve in the ANC. And Vasurti, Jazakal Khair for honoring our invite and joining us today. Shukran, thank you very much for inviting me and Asalaamu As Alaikum. What is your journey to the ANC? My journey to the ANC? My journey to the ANC. Well, you know, my journey started seriously after the unbanning of the African National Congress. At the time, I was practicing law and... Uh, That's quite late. Th th yes, I'm, I'm talking about my serious, my serious, okay. uh, started seriously with the ANC. I have not been in exile, nor have I been incarcerated prior to the release of Nelson Mandela. But upon the release of Nelson Mandela and with the unbanning of the African National Congress uh, uh, and being a lawyer, uh, it, it, it meant that I would have to represent many of our comrades uh, who were arrested, uh, represent the African National Congress, act for the National Union of Mine Workers, COSATU in general, and, and, and deal with political cases. We were only two black attorneys at the time in Rustenburg, Pontius Machila, who is now late, and myself. And uh, we were the obvious choices in terms of representation. Uh, I had no political ambitions and uh, obviously joined the African You had no political Congress. ambitions? I had absolutely none. Absolutely none because I had a very good flourishing practice, alhamdulillah, and uh, there was uh, so no you... need to go to seek something else. But there was a, re a realization that so many people had done so much for us. People who were incarcerated, people who were in exile, people who had lost their lives. And when you have an opportunity to contribute to positive change and to serve your country and those who have been oppressed, then you can't turn your back on it. So, so the work that we did at the time was really work that came from the bottom of our hearts and uh, uh, we, we served. Uh, we, we almost neglected our professional responsibilities and, and, and were really drawn into, sucked into uh, the political arena in terms of its legal landscape. That's a very interesting uh, starting point because many or most people who we interview, we speak to, uh, they, the start of their journey, whether the journey, journey really started, you know, but we believe them, uh, starts in 1976, it starts in the 80s, and, and, and there's like an emotional connection. Uh, we were at school and it started, etc. cetera, and they, and they start their journey from there. Were you an activist before well, this? Well, obviously, I was at university, and we were at, uh, I started university in <coughs> 1971. And uh, in the next year, you know, we, we had our first boycott in solidarity with the expulsion of uh, Tiro uh, at the University of the North. Uh, uh, and uh, that was really an eye-opener. I was probably 18 years old at the time, and uh, Zach Yacoub, Robin Gordon, Krish who were all activists at the time with us, and, and, and we were influenced. And that had a huge impact on, on, on who we are, because we had taken the decision at that time already that we would, not, uh, we would recognize the institution only as a tribal institution. Uh, it does not represent an autonomous uh, university. We would not have a student representative, a representative council. We would, not part, we would not utilize any of the amenities other than those for our education. So I loved sport, I played cricket, I played soccer, and you had to abandon all those wonderful opportunities uh, for a principal. Uh, so, so that 
discipline. What was the principle? The principle was non-collaboration. I mean, to firstly, to say that we cannot be in an institution and pretend that it's an autonomous and credible institution of learning when it excludes other race groups. And until such, until such time that our universities are open to all races, uh, we certainly not going to give it credence and credibility by having a student representative council. So by and large, uh, that's what we did. We, you know, I graduated twice, I did a BA and an honors degree. I did not go for the graduation ceremony because we did not recognize the institution. And similarly, when I got my legal degree, I did not go to UNISA to receive my degree because uh, it, it, it was racist and an uh, institution of learning. So, so those are principles that remained with us. So when we started practice, that commitment was there. So I would not serve and I would not encourage, in fact, I would dissuade people from serving in the management committees at the time because they are collaborative, co 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 collaborative forces. Uh, so that political principle and that kind of mild activism was with us. So nobody could ever suggest that uh, I was served in any of the structures of, 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 of the regime. In fact, I oppose it all the time. The tricameral parliament, we did what most of our brothers and sisters had done. Uh, is oppose it and, and, and dissuade people from voting. I think in Rustenburg, there probably were five people that voted in the entire community because we, we had a measure of influence on the community. You know, when we were at school, uh, my wife was a teacher at school at the time. And, uh, well, she's from Durban and we were at university together. And, 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 and you know, interesting things happen because uh, we are just in conversation, you indicated whom you married to. Uh, our young girls did not go to university and here they see somebody who studied locally, who wears, who was dressed uh, in, in, in very decent attire, who's now teaching English to the matriculants, who's very young, and uh, somehow it, the community accepted that you can be a woman who seeks education and can contribute to the development. After that, so many of our learners from Rustenburg went to university, became lawyers, became doctors, uh, became architects. And, and, and it's the result of that platform that you set up to say that education is important. Uh, and, and you know, in case people might jump up and say, but what about Islamic education? My children went to Madresa up to matric, you know? So it's a combination of the two uh, and they were complementary. So in a way, we tried very hard to, to instill uh, it's still a belief in a non-racial society. So what I share with you now is something that you could check with, 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 with the community in Rassenberg. I'll give you some good examples. And one of the person who was real, persons who really influenced me in a very significant way is the late Rashid Patel. He's a second cousin of mine. His, father, his mother and my father were first cousins. Highly intelligent. Uh, he was the chairperson of the Rassenberg Muslim Jamaat. And uh, we always look, spoke about and looked at the broader community. Uh, not the community of Zinyaville, where we were forced to live in terms of the Group Areas Act. And there was a full commitment to non-racialism. So we, he had established the Rastamad Youth Organization, and all our sport was non-racial. So we had African children playing with Indian children, uh, and it was very, very integrated. Uh, so the Rastamad Youth Organization had a constitution at that time, and I'm talking about the 60s, which spoke about non-racialism. Very progressive. Very, very progressive. And, when, and, 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 and yes. progressive in terms of time. Oh yeah, in terms of time. Well, when, and, and in people the 60s. basically, the political journey, some of them starts only after 1990. I think I was started considerably earlier. So I started practice in Rustenburg in 1977. And uh, I had to wait for about five, six years before my daughter got into school and I could then serve in the governing body. And the only governing, uh, only institution I served in was the education institution. And the very first decision we took, the very first decision that we took, and that would have been 1977, 1982, 1983, is that the school's doors of learning will be open to everybody. That's going to be non-racial. And what we did at the time, and I say we, because it's not only me, we had a principal called Umar Farouk Mutara, a very dynamic, progressive person. He's late now, he contributed very significantly to the education and well-being of our learners. We took the decision and then we had Muslim children, African Muslim children and non-Muslim uh, non African children. And we gave them Indian names and they started school with our children. So my, my, my oldest child 
started school with African children in the class in the early 80s. And every one of my children went to school with African children in the class. 1994 came long thereafter. Our school was already integrated. Our principle of non-racialism was so strong at the time that a swimming pool, the public swimming pool, was we, our learners were not allowed to use it unless and until coloreds and, uh, uh, and, and African children were allowed to use it. So during school hours, they were not allowed to use that facility for swimming because it excluded other racial groups. The library was open only for Indians only on a Wednesday. We declined, we, we certainly told our children, you cannot utilize this library, it's racist. And our children would travel as far as Johannesburg to use the library on the basis of a commitment to non-racialism. So when our democracy dawned on us, our school was already integrated. As I've indicated, already in the early 80s, African children were in, in our schools. Our hostel in the 80s was already integrated. There were African children in our hostel. So that commitment to non-racialism wasn't an ANC commitment, but it was a commitment to the values of the African National Congress. And I certainly identify with that, and those, those form part of our founding provisions of our constitution in non-racial, non-sexist, united and democratic South Africa. So our life experiences certainly had an influence in our thinking and our attitude and the values that we had as cadres of the African National Congress. But the lesson, perhaps, uh, is this, that you cannot, because of your academic qualifications, because of your intellectual competence, uh, suggest that you are entitled to represent an organization without being a member of the branch, without contributing meaningfully to your own immediate community and the broader community. You must, there, there must be a footprint in the community of contribution. And one of the things that we had learned at a very young age, and I was probably 22 when I started practice, very young, but I was really actively involved in, in a, say, because of the influence of people like Rashid Patel, Dr. Shokat Ali Token, uh, who was a, a very progressive and forward-looking visionary uh, thinker, uh, is, is that we, we've got to be part and parcel of the community uh, in, in, terms of its, in terms of our role and in terms of the leadership. So already in the 20s, we were assuming a leadership role in our community. I was chairperson of the school governing body. My cousin, Leif Shepetel, was the chairperson of Jamaat, probably the youngest chairperson of the Russian Muslim Jamaat. He died at a young age, tender age of about 35. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, but we didn't shirk off that responsibility. We were part of it, and we played sport, and we lived like everybody else, but there were some principal things that we took, decisions that we took. And the community, I must say, is a wonderful community. They never challenged it. They never argued against it. So when we said our school is non-racial, nobody ever raised their hands to say, why are African children in our schools? Or why are African children in our hostels? But it's also part of your deen. So when you go to mosque, you stand shoulder to shoulder. It doesn't matter who's standing next to you. It could be white, it could be colored, it could be African. And you do so without any reservation. So that has to be transferred in your other institutions, institutions of learning, in the social interaction that you have in the community. So it's consistent with our Islamic belief. And, and, and maybe at times, I think communities tend to forget about that particular reality. So it's been a very interesting period uh, that we face. Uh, as I've indicated, uh, Pontius Machila and I were the first two black attorneys. He started the year before, when, when, when the uprising started in 1976. He started practice there. And then I joined him in 1977. And we were, we were really brothers. So, I mean, we helped each other because, you know, at that time when we started practice in Rustenburg, two things you, I could, I, that, that I could recollect. If you were an attorney, a black attorney, you could not sit on the chair in the prosecutor's office. You had to stand discuss your business and go. When they adjourn for tea, the whites are allowed to go for tea, but Pontius Machila and I were not invited to go for tea. The cases, and in fact, my first, very first case, uh, and I remember it so clearly, you know, and although I speak Afrikaans very, very fluently, you know, was, Yiri of Pratni Afrikaans, Yiri of Pratni Afrikaans. This court doesn't speak English. 
And uh, I was shocked, I was nervous, I, was, I couldn't believe it because I'd been to Durban, I had to be in Johannesburg where I served my articles. Uh, and now I come back to Rustenburg, come back to my hometown, and I'm told, listen, you can't speak in English. Obviously, when, when it, it had arisen a second time, I told the court, I mean, you know, I have a constitutional right, it's misdaadsrecht. You know, it's, and, 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 and if the court objects to it, please place in record that you are unwilling to allow me my right to exercise my constitutional right. So that was perhaps my inroad to constitutionalism. Uh, and the court says, Khamaran and Engels. And I did so. And quite <laughs> the, the hilarious part about this is I was representing a Tswana speaking African person. And uh, I continued uh, with my case in English. And at the end of the case, and at the end of the state's evidence, uh, my guy was to give evidence. So the magistrate says to the, uh, to, 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 to you know, he's speaking in Africa, uh, he's speaking in Africa, uh, in Setswana. So, he's, no, he tells the, uh, the, the interpreter, you can, you can go. So, I asked him, with whose permission are you sending the interpreter away? He says, but you said that your client prefers English above Afrikaans. I said, that's correct, your worship, but he prefers Setswana, his mother tongue, above English. And he says, come back. And, and the guy came back, and, and in the reality, and fortunately enough, uh, they were not able to prove that he was a good witness, and, and I got an acquittal. But that very same magistrate, whom everybody feared, grew, sort of had a degree of respect, because two days after that, just two days after that, I had a dealing in Dacha case. Uh, dealing in Dacha at that time is if you had more than 115 grams of Dacha in your possession, you are deemed to be a seller. And the sentence, the minimum sentence is five years. Now, you know, that's where you've got to really work for the guys. Because, I mean, if five years for a person who's earning a living, who has to support family for having just 115 grams of dacha, and they work in the mines, they go deep un in the bowels of the earth uh, to extract platinum uh, for us, you know. And uh, I had this case, a marathon case, and the same magistrate, you know, uh, so I did it in Afrikaans, by the way. I did, I, did, I did it in Afrikaans you, because you I'm reasonably fluent in Afrikaans. Okay. Uh, he didn't ask me to do so, but I did in Afrikaans. And as I was cross-examining, you know, it was, a, it was a trap. In Afrikaans, they call it a lockfowl, you know, where you have your money, the notice marked, and, and, and they're going by with that there. So I, instead of saying nuot, I said nuota. Nuota is a musical note. Nuota, okay. So the magistrate, the same magistrate who basically was impatient with me, sends a note to me. Manir said, this nuot ni nuot ni. You know? So when we adjourned, I, I, I went to him and I said, I thank you so much for the courtesy of drawing my attention to it. Cross-examined the guy. At the end of the day, he tells the guy to stand up and he says, you know, you must thank your lawyer. Uh, you are now found not guilty in this charge. And that was the relationship that we had built as a result you know, it started off with a hostile relationship and became a very, very friendly relationship to the extent that when, I'm his, when I was in his court and if the prosecutor didn't call up my case, he says, who come with Munir Sirti so long back? So, and it was just because of language, by the way, because I was so fluent, I started reading my law reports in Afrikaans and I didn't realize at that time that it would make such a huge impact in the work that I was going to do for the African National Congress as a negotiator for the Bill of Rights. Because the National Party was mainly Afrikaans speaking. And, and, and you basically communicated with them in Afrikaans and they were comfortable. So we didn't have to vote on a single clause. We didn't have to vote on a single clause. We achieved consensus throughout. And by and large, as a result of the interaction that I've had with them, in Afrikaans, uh, obviously the other elements, but uh, that was it. So Afrikaans, in a sense, language of the oppressor, uh, help, helped uh, our organization, help our country in many ways in terms of achieving the goodwill. But Mandela says, you know, when you speak in the language that mother tongue, you speak to the heart, not to the head, you know. They, 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 they said it. In 1994, you, you mentioned a little bit of, of, of what you did in terms of the Bill of Rights, but pre-1994, there was a lot of fear in the country. There was a lot of fear amongst, I won't use the word conservative Muslims, but... Not in, in everybody, even in the Indian community. I mean, people were saying you must start storing 
groceries and uh, that's going to be bloodshed and so forth. Well, there was a potential risk of bloodshed. There's, there's no doubt about it. And especially after the murder of Chris Hani, you know, when Madiba showed his, his, his wonderful statementship by, by, by saying what he did and addressing the nature, uh, the, the nation in the manner he, that he did. But, but it was very tense at that time. People were anxious and people were afraid. Uh, but, uh, you know, some of us believe that change would come. And, and we were indeed happy and delighted that it's coming sooner than we expected, quite honestly. You're not the first person who made that, this comment, that it came sooner than expected. What was happening in the 80s into the late 80s, early 90s that, 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 that made people, that gave, the, that gave you the feeling that this thing might be drawn out? Yeah, because, I mean, the, because of the power of, 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 of the police and, and the defense force, uh, because of the strong intelligence force, because of the laws of incarceration, people keeping detained, being detained in, in communicado. Much of what you see in Palestine, obviously the degrees, are, it, ours was, was much lesser than what, what is being experienced by our brothers and sisters in Palestine. But people, they call it uh, administrative detention. Uh, ours was uh, uh, under the emergency, laws of emergency, and we were kept incommunicado, where you can't basically meet your family. And you were kept indefinitely, as, as, as occurs, uh, in, 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 in Israel right now. Uh, and and, and that, that really made things difficult. Your, your political organizations, the ANC was banned. You couldn't quote anybody from the African National Congress. Uh, so so your, your space, you had no freedom as such, freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of association. Uh, it was terrible. It was very, very hard. And, and given the strength of, 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 of the police and the intelligence itself, uh, one thought that it would take a little longer uh, than it did. I, I think the release of uh, Nelson Mandela was, was, was a wonderful boon to, to the nation. And how, then how, things... How close to that event were you? Uh, the release of Nelson Mandela, what was happening behind No, no, behind I was the not. I was not, you know, people would ask me about that. And, and quite honestly, I was not involved in the interim constitution at all. Okay. Uh, notwithstanding the fact, I was quite far removed because we were in Rassenberg at Klingdorp over there. Okay. So politically conscious, politically aware, politically consistent with what the ANC should do long before the release of Nelson Mandela and the unveiling of the African National Congress. Obviously, we knew what the ANC was and what we stood for and, and, and what, they were our heroes and heroines. Why you did know? you choose the ANC? You, I mean, you sound and you are someone of, of considerable intellect and... and, 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 and well, because and, of what I mean, and, 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 and there were many... There were many other options. There's the PAC. Yes, there's there were P I'm, I'm aware of all the organizations exactly. that, that, that what, were there. What, 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 the why, African why, National Congress. Why did, because so many people, why did so many Muslim people actually go to the ANC? Look, let's put it that way. You know, the ANC was in the, the motor force. And when, 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 when Nelson Mandela was released and Nelson Mandela was ANC, you had the popular appeal for the African National Congress. And certainly it, it, it had a much more pervasive uh, presence. Uh, compared to the other political uh, organizations like Azapo, et cetera. Uh, so, so the ANC was stronger even in exile than, than the other political parties. Your assessment of, of IFP, you, you studied in the case at Oh God, you know, IFP, uh, we, we, we certainly, I mean, you know, late Dr. Mutalezi, may his soul rest in peace. Uh, I mean, he wasn't popular with us when we were at university because we regarded him as a sellout and a collaborator. And there's no question about that, you know. You, Although, is, 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 is that still the, the opinion? Well, look, I mean, look, I, I had a good relationship with I mean, the with jury's him. still out on it, even on yeah, his yes, passing no. in the so in oh. media, it, the, the, the debate, he, he passed away. There, there's there's no that question debate. about the fact that he collaborated with the system. There's no question about okay. it. Okay. Notwithstanding the fact that he may have contributed positively. But you might, one, one cannot forget, even at the, at, at, at the threshold and the cusp of our democracy, his party was one of the few with Mangope that refused to participate in the democratic elections that they wanted an independent homeland, that they resisted a, unity, a, a government of a national unity. So, so, so one can't forget those realities. And irrespective of how he would say he was, you know, he was part of the Youth League of the African National Congress, he was in good terms with the African National Congress, he, you know, uh, he consorted I, with the leaders of the yes, African yes, National yes, Congress. There's a contentious opinion. I know we're debating about people who passed away, but I think understanding some of these principles, at least your, your opinion, might, might shed some light on what we can do in the future. I mean, the apartheid is a situation and there are role players responding to the situation. The African National Congress, Azapu, PAC, and the Smongosutu Butelezi and Mangope, etc. And this is their response 
their response is, you call it collaboration. They are saying, uh, I mean, I listened to, to Mongosuti Putelez's uh, speeches and, and discussions when he was in the USA and, and speaking about these issues. If you look at another and say, well, this was their response and they have the justifications to their response relating look, to... It's and, 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 it's a... and Ikatas also, for the lack of a bet, maybe a more nationalist a, a, a movement geographically and, 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 and ethically as it was. And as it, it, still it was is. very ethnic. Yes, you know, ethnic. It was ethnic. So, it so, represented so, the Zulu interests. Okay. It was narrow and parochial. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, but, but, but basically the ANC spoke against ethnicity in any form and shape. It says that we've got to destroy, overcome the demon of uh, ethnicity and racism. So it didn't only speak about racism, it even spoke about ethnicity, because if it did not do so, it would matter very much if you're Setswana, or you're Zulu, or Sikosa, it would matter. But because it was able to overcome these ethnic divisions, it was able do, to... Do you believe the ANC has overcome it? I know we're jumping now to 2024. I, I, I really believe we it. I know we're jumping, but I, I can understand the haste in, in trying to get where you want to get to. We, we, we Look, you know, especially I would say in the beginning, and this is why I love the African National Congress, and perhaps maybe use it anecdotally, because I know you want to know more, you're going to ask me more questions about myself. Amongst the many things, and I, I was privileged, I was privileged to, to be given the role by the African National Congress, uh, the role in many, as a provincial whip, as a negotiator of the Bill of Rights, as, as a chief whip. And as a chief whip, you have huge, huge authority. You can determine when a minister comes in, how long he or she is going to speak for, where the minister is going to speak at what time. You, you basically manage politically the parliament. And, and your, your, your link is basically with two people. The leader of government business was usually the deputy president. In my, in, in my time, it was Jacob Zuma. And uh, the, the uh, secretary general of the African National uh, Congress was Khalil Mambutlante, with whom I worked when I was minister of justice and he was the president of our country. And in that five years, you chair caucus, co-chair caucus with the, chair, uh, co uh, with the chief whip of the National Assembly, who was Tony Yengeni at the time. And, 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 and you engage with the entire body of the African National Congress. There wasn't one single day where my authority was questioned on the basis of my race or where I was disrespect, disrespected, uh, where people showed any form of disrespect simply because I was an Indian. It was a completely non-racial organization at the time. It was inclusive in terms of what it did. And our commitment was a complete, complete commitment to a non-racial ethos. What has indeed occurred afterwards is there was a tendency amongst some quarters to become more nationalist and more, more Africanist, uh, excluding very, very uh, you know, important cadres who had contributed very meaningfully to the organization. Some are bitter, some are unhappy about that reality, that why is it not as representative as it was? Because our elections were fought on the basis of inclusivity and representativity, both in terms of race and gender. So somehow gender, we were able to succeed better, and, and, and there was a decline in terms of representativity uh, from a national perspective in terms of, of that there. Uh, it's being addressed. We've raised it. We've raised it in, in the conferences. We've raised it with those in authority. But we, because that ten tendency has emerged, we cannot walk away from it. We must resist it and overcome it. And you don't overcome it from a distance. You are part of an organization and a movement, and you've got to influence and shape the movement from within. So, uh, so are you saying, as someone who's, who's, who's part of the movement and close to the decisions make, decision makers in the movement uh, and privy through your own channels to understand what's happening in the movement, is this something that the ANC has taken cognizance of, that there is a feeling amongst minorities that... Well, we've raised it. I've raised, raised it, it and, and I can be quoted to say that I've raised it in the National Conference of the African National Congress, in the presence of Kalema Mutlante, in the presence of Jacob Zuma, in the presence of Cyril Ramaphosa, in the presence of Jesse Duarte. I raised specifically the issues of representativity, not in a quiet corner, amongst comrades and cadres. And nobody opposed it. They were all in agreement. And, and, and that is still part of the policy of the African National Congress. And in fact, it is the criterion for, 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 for eligibility of candidates within the organization. Whether it's implemented in terms of policy that, is another question. That's the next question, because that's the question is how serious is the Well, you know, it, it, it of, is of, it, about this. Nobody's about this being issue excluded. At the nobody's being consciously excluded. But, you know, if I have erred in, in term politically, and, and many of my comrades 
uh, in, in, of our generation is we were so drawn into the responsibilities that we had politically in terms of our executive responsibility or our responsibility as parliamentarians that we did not take time and did not make the effort to nurture, mentor, develop and train young cadres who would follow us. That's our responsibility. That's, I, I, I would take the responsibility for that because they're going to ask me, but what did you do to ensure that I was developed as you were developed and nurtured by the African National Congress? How did, what, did, what, what pressure did you put on me to ensure that I go to branch meetings, that I participate actively as a youth? Now, I'm not saying I did nothing at all, but I say, I'm certainly saying that I didn't do enough insofar as that is concerned. And it's not out of sheer complacency or laziness. laziness. And, I, and I'm, saying that, I'm not saying this in defense of the cadres, is that the enormous responsibilities that we had, either in the executive or otherwise, were so huge that we hardly had time to, 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 to look at other elements, but we should have made the time. And I, I think we've heard, and, and it certainly should take responsibility and accountability for that. And we apologize to our youth. Thank you, for, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you for that. That's, I'm sure that is, will be deeply appreciated by, 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 by the viewers and the listeners. We're in conversation with Enver Surti. We'll be back soon. In Conversation With is proudly sponsored by Africa Cash and Carry Crown Mines. In Conversation With Enver Surti. Where was your first big deployment in the African National Congress? Well, my first big deployment in terms, if I look at uh, my huge, biggest deployment was to be part of the negotiating team of the Bill of Rights. That was which year? That was in 1994 to 1996. We had to do the constitution within two years. And as I've indicated, I was not part of the interim constitution, but I certainly was part of the final constitution. And I was assigned the task to, to be part of it. Uh, I, 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 I started as an observer member, which means that basically you, you're in the discussion, you're in the conversation, but you can't speak. And then I had the right to speak. And then I was asked to be a negotiator and drafter of many of the provisions in the Bill of Rights. So. Um, uh, it, it, it was a phenomenal experience and quite interestingly, very interestingly, I know you're going to get to that in our conversation, is the chairperson of the study group of the ANC on the Bill of Rights was none other than Naledi Pandu. So my submission would go to Naledi Pandu and, uh, uh, and, and the other co-chair who was a uh, shepherd from uh, Satu. And, and, and they would have to look at it and be happy with it and then process it, uh, and, and, and that would be it. So our relationship, and I was a, I was a provincial whip, and Naledi Pandu at that time was a deputy chief whip in the National Assembly. So that was our relationship. So that was an important deployment, and perhaps the most interesting phase of my political life is to be able to breathe some life into the Constitution, to learn about it, and to learn as quickly as I could. And, and what I did, uh, because I, I discovered very quickly that uh, the DA, and the N, well, there was the NP and the DP at the time, were, were receiving advice from academics uh, in terms of, of, of how to approach the matter. So I did an LLM at the same time. Uh, so I knew what the conversations were. And it was a partnership between University of Western Cape and University of Cape Town. So interestingly enough, they would want to know more from me than I would want to learn from them because I was in the, in, in the center of, of, of constitutional making in terms of the Bill of Rights. But what it did is I was able to determine already what the thinking was and prepare for it in argument. So it became so easy when you sat with the NP and the DA in plenary or, you know, or in your committees uh, and they raise these points because you know wh wh what the source is, you know exactly uh, and, and you fleshed it out almost academically, uh, so it became very, very easy. And that, that was a wonderful opportunity to, to, to have that academic uh, leaning, uh, which assisted me in my political uh, experience. And obviously, you know, we had wonderful people in the committee. I mean, you know, uh, Naledi Pando was there, Balega Mbete was there, very stalwarts of the African National Congress. It's, yeah. on, on the discussion of the Constitution, 
what was the main difference? Okay, let me read in, 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 in a simple term that even I probably understand better to myself is, why didn't we just not continue with the previous constitution, remove apartheid and continue? It's, it, I know, it's, it's very simplistic, yeah. but you I think know, it's important for us to, to understand cons- yeah. what, 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 why did we need a new constitution? Yeah, Couldn't inter- we just remove apartheid yeah, like, and we go on, go on with life? The interim constitution was a document that was developed uh, by all political parties, uh, those that were unbanned and those that were in government. So, so it was a negotiated uh, constitution, but it didn't have the participation of the people. Uh, the interim constitution didn't have socio-economic rights, for example. Uh, it didn't have third and fourth generation rights, like right to information, right to administrative justice. Could, could, couldn't we do like... No, uh, no what could, I'm could, saying... Could, could, couldn't we take the constitution then? Why did we have to develop a new constitution? Because could, it could, had couldn't, to be people driven. Couldn't, couldn't we then, as our experience goes, amend, 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 amend? No, or but... But, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just yeah, no, no. because that was a phrase, it was good. There were, there were elements in the interim constitution that were excellent. I mean, because all political parties participated in the process. Even Rajbansi was there, you know, uh, from the uh, House of Delegates, uh, you know, they clapped him also once, but I mean, he was there. <laughs> uh, so, so everybody had a say there, but it was, it did not, it, it wasn't the voice of the people because the people had not spoken. And we had perhaps the most inclusive transparent and democratic process of constitutional making between 1994 and 1996. We went to every corner of the, of the country. We received thousands of submissions. In, in the Bill of Rights, I perhaps had most submissions over there. And every, every voice counted. And we looked at those submissions, by the way. They influenced us. But there were, there were limitations in, 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 in the constitution itself. I mean, the way in its structure and its form. And, and, and one had to basically engage with it. But now we were a people's parliament because we were represented by the electorate. The interim constitution was a composition of people who got together with political, vested political interests, but it wasn't the people's voice. So that was a necessary process. And, 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 and certainly we did look very carefully at the constitution, uh, the interim constitution. But I mean, we looked at the, the covenants, we looked at the Human Rights Charter, we looked at the European Union, we looked at the African uh, constitution. So all those elements were there. And, we, and particularly from an ANC perspective, we looked at our Freedom Charter and we looked at our African Claims document because those were the basis of what we were going to in, include in there. So if you look at the interim constitution, for example, and you look at the right to dignity, it's changed because in, 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 in the final constitution, we speak about inherent dig- dignity. Uh, which, which, which is very close to the United uh, Nations Declaration of Human Rights, you know, the first, first uh, provision there. So, so, so uh, the, the, the one in the, the property rights uh, was so heavily entrenched in, 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 in the interim constitution, you probably couldn't do anything from intellectual or other, otherwise. We changed that uh, completely and, and, and we provided for provisions for, for expropriation and we added public interest where there was only public good. We added public interest. We described what public interest was. We I- included uh, restitution uh, of rights. We spoke about redress. Our equality clause is the first in the country, not in the country, almost the first in the world where we have it apply horizontally and not vertically only. So before, the, in, in the interim constitution, it was a relationship between the state and the citizens in terms of equality. We simply said, no, the state and no person shall discriminate on the following basis. And there were academics and, and, and very, uh, well, respected uh, lawyers, even lawyers for the ANC, who felt that we were going too far in introducing the horizontal, in, in, in the introducing 20, our in horizontal the, application, yes. In the year 2024, looking back at our constitution, how it was developed and where it is now. To, to how, how do you oh, assess it's, it? It's a beacon of uh, hope, man, because the pro- uh, constitution protects us and protects. And you know, one, one, one argument that Cyril Ramaphosa at that time made, and, and which still holds good, he says, drop the constitution as if you are not in power. So if you were in the minority or if you were in the opposition, what kind of constitution would you like to have? So then you know that the constitution is fair. It will protect the rights, not only of those who are in government or who are in the governing party, but those who are in the opposition. It would then be a good constitution. And certainly we use that as a yardstick to say, you know, what if we are not there? Would this be a clause that we would want to latch on to embrace uh, and, and, and regard as a, as, as, as a redeeming provision 
uh, to protect our rights and our interests. Did Muslim entities, Muslim organizations, they did, did, did you did, know, did they, did they give input? Are you, I won't say are you satisfied, but was 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 it were, were they good quality inputs? Oh, I, I must say, you know, I, I I could mention, and you know, that's perhaps you know my relationship with the United Ulama Council goes far back. And, and they made a representation quite interestingly after we almost finalized the constitution. And they were very concerned about a clash between closely held Islamic beliefs and constitutional provisions. So say the right of equality, gender equality. What if there's a clash between the two? Does the court just let the clause of gender equality trump uh, your Islamic beliefs or does it balance the two? And, and we created a provision with the permission of Sarah Ramaphosa, and it went through the process, by the way, and uh, uh, I, write about, I write about this experience, but I don't know if I write specifically about this representation that we received. Uh, I know there was a, a very hi highly competent lawyer from KwaZulu-Natal at the time. His name escapes me, but he's quite an expert uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in Islamic law, uh, jurisprudence, especially in, in uh, interstate law. Uh, Dr. Jassad was there, Rem Saluji was there, uh, I think Molana Baum was there, uh, I think Molana Patel was there. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, they, they came with this re re uh, request quite late, where the management committee had already agreed to those provisions. And it was just had to be formally accepted by the Constitutional Assembly. And I received this request and uh, I asked. Cyril Ramaphosa, our current president, whether we couldn't accommodate them. And he says, no, go and meet them. O accommodate the presentation, at least. No, to, okay. to see, to, 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 to receive a submission. To receive the submission, sorry. So he second. asked me, authorized me to, to meet with them, as because I was part of the negotiating okay. team and part of the secretariat of the ANC in the constitution making process. And I did so, and I'm glad I did so. And I, I really want to get the lawyer's name because he's such a good person, very competent guy. And I told them, please, you know, I li listen to their representation. And, and it was a legitimate concern that they had. And we, we, we made an amendment to a provision in the constitution where the court is now obliged to look at how closely held belief it is. So, so if it's, for example, to say the length of your pants as uh, compared to gender equality, it, it, gender equality would probably trump. But if it's about your belief in monothe your monotheistic uh, belief, uh, or, 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 or your, your belief in, in, in inheritance as, as is set out in the Quran, then it has to balance the two in a way uh, that, that, that is fair. It doesn't disregard uh, your Islamic uh, closely held beliefs. And, and that was a result of the submission made by the United Ulama yeah, Council. It, it is, it is, definitely so. It is, it is so, definitely so. So a Muslim organization the Dharma Council had an input. No, absolutely, absolutely. They are aware of it. They had an input. I think in it's it. very important for the for the record. You know, we 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 we, li we live in an environment where there's there's you always know, the extreme, there's always extreme criticism of the ANC being communist, yeah. extreme criticism of Maulana's being conservative. Ex there's always extremes, and, and you we you don't know, give interestingly credit. enough. You raised this here, and I, I think we spoiled for choice. And I give you an example. In our constitution, it's it's quite phenomenal that we have a provision that promotes Arabic, Sanskrit, Hebrew. It promotes Gujarati, Urdu, Telugu, Tamil. It's a million. And, 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 and nobody made a submission, by the way. Nobody asked for it. We, we did it. You know, you can say, thank Praveen Gordon and Basurti for, for including that there. But we couldn't make it narrow. I couldn't just have Arabic and not have uh, uh, Hebrew out there or Sanskrit out there. So we, we made it broad enough to include everybody. But we put it in as a founding provision in the Constitution. Now, nobody said thank you to us, but we didn't even announce to the world, hey, listen, this is what Praveen and I did. But that's what we did. We put it to the Secretariat. We put it to all political parties. They accepted it. So why should we argue about it? So there was no argument about it. But it was not in the interim Constitution. It was introduced in the final Constitution. I'm just giving you one of no, many examples. No, I appreciate it. And, 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 and that must indeed be recognized. This amendment here, because helped us such a great deal in terms of freedom of expression, where, where, where there was something, uh, a challenge against uh, some, uh, some uh, against the Muslim community or, or something, uh, 
at the time, and I know it went to the Gauteng High Court, and quite interestingly, the judge that was sitting there was a Muslim, and he relied on this particular provision to say that this limitation has to be respected because there's a limitation in terms of freedom of expression and a limitation in terms of Section 15.1, I think, of, of the Constitution. Now, another important part, and, and here again, now it's so interesting that we're having a conversation at this time. Uh, and I could share this with you. Uh, now, Lady Panlo is an incredibly, remarkably intelligent, gifted, uh, eloquent, uh, and honest person. And uh, we, well, we were, we were part of the study group of the ANC in the constitution making process. And, 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 and we, the interim constitution provided for freedom of expression without any limitations, without any limitations. Drafted the amended constitution and I put in a limitation, introduce a limitation on the basis of religion, on the basis of race and on the basis of gender. So if there's hate speech, in relation to those three elements over there, then they, they, it's just if there's Im, Im, imminent harm, you know, that can be caused as a result of that, then it can be the freedom of expression can be limited. Unusual. So obviously there was an outcry from within the organisation, and I'm not going to mention names. Senior members of the African National Congress receive a call. You have to attend a meeting. At the hotel very close to. Uh, parliament. So two of us are called, Naledi Pando and Envasurti. Both happen to be Muslim, by the way. And we call because of our role in, 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 in the process, not because we are Muslim, by the way. And the argument is basically, why are we limiting the right to freedom of expression? And we argued that, you know, at that time we had the Bosnian situation over there. Uh, we had the situation in Gaza, interestingly enough, the Intifada had happened over there. And then and, and, and we raised how religion, because they, the argument was mainly against religion, less about race, how religion basically could uh, create a problem, religious intolerance and, you know, hate speech against a religious group can create this particular uh, situation. And, 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 and uh, you know, so I was a spokesperson and our lady was a spokesperson. The two of us spoke and we had to now, we had senior, senior members. In the audience, you had Nelson Mandela, Tabu Mbeki, Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, who was our Deputy Secretary General, the lady, oh God, man. Jinwala? No, 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 not Jinwala, not Jinwala. I'm, uh, oh, you know, so, 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 so close to me. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting old now. Uh, and the Treasury General was there. And uh, we, had to, we had to persuade the, 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 the big five at the time. There was no chairperson, national chairperson at the time of the ANC, uh, that indeed uh, our cause is right. And after uh, Naledi Pando's very eloquent exposition, I write about this, by the way, in, in, in my book, uh, In Pursuit of Dignity. Okay. Uh, the story is there. And I, I consciously put the story there that all the participants who were part of that conversation would be able to read it. And if they disagreed with that truth, then they would say so. So uh, they, they've all had the book for, for many years now. And it has never been contested. But what is interesting out there is it concluded with the following, and I, and I raised this. Nelson Mandela said, after listening to arguments on both sides, I am rather shocked and surprised that there is opposition to a limitation clause of hate speech against religion. I thought our founding fathers in the African National Congress were very religious people. They were reverence, they were learned religious people, and there was never any opposition to religious beliefs or a respect for religion in relation to our cohesion. So if at all you want to exclude religion, then you must exclude race, and then you must exclude gender. That was the last word. No other arguments ours went through, alhamdulillah. And, and that's why we have the limitation clause today. And now as we look back, I'm sure Naledi feels, and she must be smiling wherever she's sitting. She says, you know, and we've made the right decision. I mean, I, I, I remember in 2006, there was the Danish cartoon issue and they were about to publish a cartoon. That in South Africa, in the South Houting Africa. case, that is exactly and the same case. And then Mawlana Baum, Jamaat al-Ulama, they opposed, the, I think it was I'm the I'm saying the limitation clause 
and the other one, the Section 50, okay. those two combined basically gave us the opportunity to, to, to prohibit the publication of that. Of the Scott uh, yes. of Six. So, so, so I'm saying that that is the value of, of what has been done. And that was done by the African National Congress. My Lady Pando was in the African National Congress. I was in the African National Congress. And the ANC supported the Muslim community at a time when it could be dismissive. It was so small in number and it was relevant. And you know the Muslim uh, public representative, Yusuf Pahad, Aziz Pahad, uh, Ibrahim Patel, Farika, Fatima Chohan, Yahya, it's now Johnny Delanga, uh, you know, have contributed significantly to our transformation. And not one of them has, not a finger has been pointed against any one of them for malfeasance or corruption. Not one of them. 30 years, not one of them. So I'm still proud to be a member of the African National Congress because they are still there. Naledi is still there and she's Muslim and she's a member of the ANC. And we, we've never disputed and denied the fact that there's corruption, there's malfeasance, that we have to deal with these matters, the issues of inclusivity, etc., etc. We have do to you, deal with these matters. Do, do you think the ANC today possesses that type of, uh, that depth of, of, of intellectual prowess, the, the sincerity that that, that, that an, uh, 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 generation of leaders had, and, and, and that vision that they had. Does the ANC have that? I mean, the question is for all political parties, but if any political party should have to do with the ANC, to take us into the next 30 years, we, globally, globally, there's, there's a realignment in Europe, yeah. there's a realignment in Asia, there's artificial intelligence, uh, there's mass migration into South Africa. South Africa is changing. I mean, some of the guests who have been sitting here are saying, oh, be, they, 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 they've calculated numbers in South Africa, uh, the different organizations spoken to. And they're saying there's about what, two point some odd, two, let's say two and a half million Muslims at the moment. And by the next election, in the next seven or eight years, that number might go up to five or five and a half because of the migrants Migration. who are becoming yes. legal. The, no, the current migrants are yes, 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 The yes, current yes. Somalis and Bengalis. Yes, yes, no. and you have to just who, go to our masjid. You know, who, who, yeah, who, who, to, who to will be entering yeah. the process legally. Yeah. So that could explode in the next few years. So. Uh, Generally, at the ANC at the moment, is do you believe or are you satisfied with your concern? Does the ANC? I'm not, not even talking about about uh, about fixing roads and fixing potholes. No, no. Yeah. At, at, at the visionary level, you know, does the ANC have the depth at the moment to take itself? I think there? it does. I think it does. I I, I think I, it's a yes and a no. A no. The no would be the, the 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 disappointment is that the deployment of cadres to parliament and legislatures was almost, uh, you know, the, it wasn't looked at, reflected on very seriously. They didn't look at the issues of experience, skills, representativity, service to community, etc. strongly enough and closely enough. There was a great deal of opportun political opportunism that went into the process. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody is like that. I, I think a measure of the capacity of the ANC would be, if you look at the ICJ, its presentation led by a young Minister of Justice, led by Naledi Pando, a seasoned uh, Minister of International Relations, who's, 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 and a Muslim, by the way, and, uh, uh, and, and did such a profoundly wonderful job in terms of putting a principal position. Now that courage, that fortitude, that boldness, that bravery of the ANC, you don't find it anywhere else. Not on the continent, not in our country, and not in the world. We were the first to do it. Now to say that you still have second thoughts about an organization that is willing to say that we, we've lost trillions in income as a result of, 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 of punitive measures, that we are being compromised in terms of relations with the strongest powers, the European Union, the United States, that notwithstanding all that, we stood for the truth and principle in solidarity with people who have stood with us, and who happen to be Muslim, that should have some meaning, should have some weight, some gravitas in terms of our understanding. And if it becomes insignificant in the minds of our people, then they must have really retrospect. Because what we see in television is the strength of belief in Imam, in the brothers and sisters and the children in Palestine. We see the strength of Imam 
in those soldiers who are fighting in Yemen, our brothers, are in, the Yemenis, we see that solidarity out there. And we see a lack of it in, 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 in quarters where we thought it would emerge strongest in the Muslim community. So that needs some reflection to say, what is this righteousness and this commitment to justice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Quran that is peremptory on us, that from the basis of the life of our Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was about justice, it's about equity. And this is what the ANC, in your opinion, opposed? My opinion is in terms of this particular situation, yeah. it basically did the most Islamic thing that one could think of. It has to do a lot more in terms of addressing the state capture issues, the corruption issues, the malfeasance issues. But at the end of the day, I mean, uh, there's another way of framing this. And the other way of framing this is saying Gaza, Palestine, it's part and parcel of South African foreign policy. And South Africa has done great work as a government in the Gaza issue. Mm -hmm. But what are, your foreign policy is African based and SADC based. What, what are we doing on our own borders? What are we doing with migration Good on borders? So, 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 so I'm saying, what is the context? Because I mean, the, it's, okay. I'm, I'm, the issue is also, you know. Okay, no, uh, we're, we're, may we're, I answer? No, no, I just want to get, you know, um, because the, the Gaza and that is very important to me and to you as Muslims, but other ANC constituents, uh, especially if you look at, 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 at the, the poor, uh, the uneducated, the unemployed, etc. Uh, how does that issue of a foreign policy impl uh, 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 affect their, 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 their livelihoods, the betterment of their situation? And, and I'm still waiting to hear about the other side of the ANC is the side that makes you believe they do not have the capacity, the depth and okay. knowledge to go. I'll, I'll go to that immediately, I'll, I'll, it's, after, it's immediately after I've, I've responded to that. You know, uh, just, just a month ago, the deputy president was in uh, the DRC. No, 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 not the deputy president. Our former minister of justice um, uh, uh, was in the DRC as a special envoy uh, sent by the government to assist out there. We have troops as well uh, deployed over there to assist in the peacekeeping. We are in, in Mozambique. Minister Jeff Khadebe was there. Yeah, Jeff, Minister Jeff Khadebe was there. He was there. Uh, it's a special envoy it's sent by, 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 by our president. Uh, and and, and uh, with the team, he didn't go there as a single individual, with the team over there, uh, supported by DIRCO, by the International Relations. You've, you've been in that environment, so you would know how it works. Uh, we, we, we are in Mozambique uh, as well, providing support. And one part of your Lady R uh, issue rotates around the need for those weapons that we required for our special forces in Mozambique, by the way. Okay. And so you, didn't, you might not know about it. I served on the panel. I can. No, I, I do know that that uh, mm -hmm. I, I I read the very interesting uh, five-page report. Uh, okay. But, but I want to ask. Well, uh, we we crafted a much more long, longer report. No, I know that yeah. is the... So I can't disclose everything else, but I'm just sharing that with you. Yeah. As I'm sitting here, I'm a facilitator with the uh, human uh, with, with the uh, High Commissioner of the United Kingdom in Southern Sudan, and while we are in Southern Sudan. We are also trying to engage in issues in Sudan. So yes, Mozambique, yes, DRC, yes, Southern Sudan, and Sudan itself. And obviously we play an important role in the African Union. So, so to suggest that we're only looking at uh, Palestine uh, and, and not and ignoring the, uh, the, the Africa would not be true. So as, I, as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm now part of the facilitators, two of us facilitating there because our deputy president is a special envoy yes. there. Just three years ago, I was with Dikrang Museneke, busy with constitutional reform in Lesotho. Lesotho. When we started there, the army was there, <laughs> the, the, the military presence in the streets. Within three months, they were all gone. And they had an election without a first being thrown. South Africa drove the process because our president, Serrano Maposa, was the delegate for, by SADC. And because he became president, he was deputy president at the time, he became president, he asked SADC whether we could basically continue on, on, on his behalf as a collective and report to SADC, which we did. So my personal experience takes me to two, two countries. And I'm certain if you go to DIRCO, they will tell you about the other countries 
with South Africa is really involved and engaged in. I, I know Somalia. And you know, interestingly enough, when, when I was in Southern Sudan, uh, uh, I, I meet the United Nations rep, uh, Fink Hazen, South African, advisor to Nelson Mandela, involved in the constitutional making process, particularly the interim constitution. And so what a wonderful person, South African is contributing now to, to change and, and, and stability there. So, so with regard to competencies and skills, uh, yes, look, you know, some skills you can't get. You, it's going to be difficult to get another O.R. Tambo. It's going to be difficult to get another Nelson Mandela. It's difficult to get another Paolo Giordano. But, 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 I'm, saying, but I'm saying we've, we've had a category, a, a group of leaders, and we've lost many of them over there. We, 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 we have skilled people over here and we must get our politics right we must get our deployment right in terms of those institutions and i'm not suggesting at all that it is correct so parliament is certainly not what it was i would certainly i certainly do believe that it can do much better but amongst those that are in parliament they are very competent uh, dedicated skilled people who can contribute that's in your legislatures as well so we shouldn't be over hasty in our generalization but, but at the same time be realistic to say that the ANC has erred in its deployment. I mean, you do understand that, uh, that the frustration of the public when what we see out of the executives, whenever they open their mouths, they're gaffing, they're talking nonsense, videos of, 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 of ministers drunk, partially drunk, some, I mean, the, the behavior, the utterances. We, 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 I, I, I mean, if, 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 and I think this is when we compare what we have today in terms of leadership, to what we had in leadership during your time. That, that is a comparison. We're not, we're not looking for an hour tumble. We're just looking for an executive where people don't get drunk. There are, there, there are, there are, there are no rape allegations. There are no battering allegations. There are no, we, we, we're, just yeah, looking, but, we're just looking for some type of relative decent behavior because we expect, and I'm sure you would agree, that members of public office at that level should be held to a much higher level of accountability and, and conduct uh, than, 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 than the rank and file and of, of all the organization. I, 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 certainly, I certainly agree with you. I certainly agree with you. And I will never try to defend something that is wrong. I mean, blatantly wrong. So if there's any corruption, if there's any abuse, if there's any uh, allegations of rape, etc., we can't be sitting in defense of those people out there. Uh, I, I don't think there, there is a place and there shouldn't be a space for them. But I'm saying at the same time, there are people who are doing wonderful work in Parliament. So we shouldn't be over hasty. Give me I just few, give you an example. Give me a few names of, of some uh, of the good uh, people still in the ANC. Uh, people you, you think? talking about the executive itself? Wherever in the ANC. Ibrahim Patel is extremely hardworking. Uh, you've got uh, Gwen. Uh, well, Gwen is now, uh, I'm so glad she's now a, a, uh, uh, in, in the executive of the ANC. Uh, Gwen Ramachoka, who's the treasurer. Absolutely brilliant. Joe Patla. The, the, the Minister of Health, he's got a huge task at hand. The NHI is not easy, by the way, but he's honest, hardworking, disciplined. Uh, uh, well, I worked with Angie Motsecha. She might have a shortcomings in certain areas, but she is competent, she's skilled, she's a good listener, and she's producing the results, uh, irrespective of what they say. So, so, so amongst them, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to give a report card okay. to, no. to all the ministers, no, but, but I'm just... saying, I'm saying to you that in cabinet there are people. I mean, you, you will, you obviously say, why not Lady Pando? Obviously, he would come first. I've worked so long with her, and I was a deputy minister anyway for for a period of time. So our link is uh, it's almost we're almost inseparable in, in, from that perspective. But uh, but but there are people who are good. The, the current minister of justice. Some people might have different views, but uh, my opinion, he's done relatively well. Given his youth, uh, he he's done extremely well. There isn't an unease about him managing the portfolio as such. So 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 there's huge potential uh, going forward. Uh, we must be more selective. We must be more cautious in terms of our appointment. And I'm not going to disagree insofar as that is concerned. But I, I think, you know, we, we, my generation, gain from the experience of those above us. I mean, the Albertina Sisulus uh, and those that had served for, for such a long time. I mean, for me to go into parliament and sit in the same chamber and be in the company of Governor Mbeki, and, and, and his son is now deputy president at that time and then becomes president. I've learned from them. I've listened to them. 
So I didn't know these things. I gained from them the immature I imbibed. And so too will a new generation imbibe from us. And where we erred, where we erred as a collective is that we didn't develop adequately. There are many young comrades and cadres who are extremely good, but we didn't do so broadly and strongly enough. And you know, an opportunism and greed has crept in. Yes, uh, indeed, and political games are being played, but uh, that is the reality uh, that, that, that is there. So I'm saying, I'm confident that there is uh, ability. But, you know, I, I, I would want you, as you engage with people at your level, at social level, find out how many, go to 50 people, just at random, not only where you're staying, but around the country because you travel far and wide. Go to the Indian community and ask them how many, is there any of you who has attended a branch meeting? If you get two out of 50, you are very lucky. Now, that's a very important question. Yes. If you want to express an opinion about a political party and you're not willing to even go to a branch meeting, do you genuinely think you, 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 others must do it for you? Shouldn't you be able to say, look, I will take that responsibility and be part of it and raise my voice there. And then if it's not heard, then I can say, well, look, I've raised it. Like I've raised now. I said, this is what I said about representativity. Go down, ask the comrades, and you out the on air. So my president can hear, Ramaphosa will be able to hear, Jacob Zuma will be able to hear. Did Enver Suti say that or didn't he say so? He said so in the presence, not of one delegate, more than 250 in the commission. And I was a rapporteur in every this thing I would give a rapporteur either for justice or social development. So you got the whole plenary there. So, so, but at least I've raised the voice and I continue to raise it. Where's, where's your branch? My branch is in Houghton. In Houghton. Yeah. When did you leave Rustenburg? I left Rustenburg a few years ago. Okay. And I've been to Houghton meetings, okay. by the way. I've no, been no, no. Meetings, <laughs> yes, yes. I've been there. Oh, that's great. And so has my wife. <laughs> yeah, she's also a comrade. She chaired the meeting for a branch for more than 12 years. That's great. For more than 12 years. And it was a non-racial branch. It included coloreds, included Africans, and included whites. That's great. Enver Surti, mm -hmm. we'll be back with you now. Are we on conversation with Enver Surti? No. Stick around. In conversation with is proudly sponsored by Africa Cash and Carry Crown Mines. In conversation with Enver Surti, Enver Surti is unique among ANC cadres in that you uh, endured through the Mbegi term, Khalema Mutlante, Jacob Zuma. You got part of President Ramaphosa? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, it, it was an extraordinary privilege. I mean, um, so shukar, it's a privilege that I, I certainly was in, in, in Parliament when Nelson Mandela was our president. Uh, I certainly wasn't in the executive at that time, but I was in the executive with Thabo Mbeki, who was my president while I served as a minister. You were minister of education? Then? Deputy minister Dep of education. Sorry, deputy deputy education. minister of education. With our lady Pando at the time. I, I, I was with Halima Mutlante. I was the minister of justice at the time. I was with Cyril Ramaphosa when I was deputy minister of basic education. So I've, I've served with all the presidents so, of the so, country, uh, and they are all unique. And so most... And Jacob Zuma, obviously. No, that, that, pardon, that, that, pardon. That, that, I haven't... Uh, it, it, it's, it's an omission. That, that's right. very common because you <laughs> mentioned uh, state capture. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, but most of the ministers who made it from the Taubo Mbeki cabinet into the Jacob Zuma cabinet were, 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 were ardent supporters of Jacob Zuma, or rather, let me say, they were part of the Umshiniwa movement in Polokwane. I mean, I, I, you know, Not I, all I, of them. I, I, I clearly remember Trevor Manuel resigned. Yes. And there was an interview. And, it, it, you know, I, it, it, it sticks in my mind. And in the interview, he said, I asked him, why did you resign, you know? Uh, and he said, I served at the pleasure of my president, and my president has changed, and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and I'm leaving. But then he was back as the minister. No, no, and, 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 and Jacob Zuma. But, uh, then, then, but he left under Jacob Zuma. No, but he, was a, he was a minister. Wasn't he a minister in the no. presidency? No. Oh, no, he, he, no, was, no. He, he was the head of the uh, development plan, national yeah. development plan, you yeah, know, with yeah. Cyril Ramaphosa as the deputy chair. Yeah. Yes. yes. So, yes. so, so, I mean, so uh, what, what, what was your role politically, well, you yeah. know, when, when in, in Polokwane? Because Polokwane seems to be a well, watershed moment. It I seems was... like a, a, a watershed moment for the ANC, because today we're sitting with the MK party and we have to go back to Polokwane. Yeah, I was, it, I was in Polokwane. 
and uh, certainly I was as in, when 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 Tabo Mbeki was withdrawn, I was on my way back from Cameroon. I remember it was Ramadan, and I was on my way home, and we were called to a meeting, all ministers and deputy ministers, and given the assurance that none of us would basically lose our positions as a result of the recall of uh, Tabo Mbeki because of the judgment in a case uh, that had taken place in Peter Maritzburg. Uh, we were invited to speak, and I mentioned, I mentioned in that meeting, in the presence of Jacob Zuma, Kalima Motlanti was there, I mentioned that I think that the judgment was a very poor judgment. And whilst I am certainly pleased that uh, it benefits uh, our president, at that time he was not the president of the, of the country. What was the judgment in Peter Maritzburg? The judgment was that there was political influence. Okay, yes. There was political influence and that, as that a judgment. result, yeah, political influence in the decision to prosecute uh, Jacob Zuma. And, and, but there was no evidence to that effect. And, and I read the, I'd read the judgment before I came in. I said so, and I said it in the most respectful way, to the extent that uh, one of my former colleagues, who was also deputy minister of communications at the time, told me, are you crazy or what? to raise a matter like that. So I asked him, was I crass or crude or rude in the manner in which he says, no, you were very respectful. But I wouldn't, he said, ah, but I wouldn't do that. Well, I did it because I felt it was the case. And lo and behold, a month after that, I'm called to the chief whoops office. Kalima Mutlante is now made president. I'm now made president of justice. And when I go to the chamber, Sitting up there is Jacob Zuma, waving at me. So you were not part of the of, of the movement. Why would I say what I said? Ashid, no, you, you were not part of the movement that ushered in Jacob Zuma. No, absolutely not. So people are now asking me, they can understand why I, after doing such a good job as a minister of justice, I wasn't a minister of justice in the second term. <laughs> <laughs> is it because of? And you know, I, I don't care. To me, it didn't what matter. What was your relationship with President very Jacob Zuma? Very good. Zuma? With Jacob Zuma, ex is, is very good. What? Excellent. As a chief whip, I, I, he was the leader of government business. Very respectful, very decent. He would never leave the chamber without asking my permission as chief whip. Can you believe it? And he was the deputy president. So he would write to me, he says, I have this, may I? I say, you don't even have to ask me, deputy president, you may. And, and he was very, very respectful, and, and, and I've, I've always had a good relationship with him. Till, till the end, I've had a good relationship with him. To pretend otherwise, the only thing is what changed when Tabo Mbeki wasn't there, and Jacob Zuma was there, uh, was, and, and to an extent, I think Trevor Manuel had a hand in that, <laughs> is that deputy ministers were no longer invited to cabinet meetings, and they would only be present at the request of the president. So when the discussions took place, whether it's about Zondo, the issues raised in the Zondo Commission or whatever else, we did not form part of cabinet as, as deputy ministers. We could not influence cabinet. And I certainly would not take responsibility for those decisions because I wasn't part of the discussion. But you were part of the bigger environment of what happened in the movement. You were seeing yes, people. Yes, I, I was, I was, but certain decisions so had to be taken. You don't... And, and, I yeah. mean, you're not attending the cabinet meeting. Yes. But you, you attend parliament meetings, yes, NEC meetings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, so, but in parliament, you basically, if you're a member of the executive, you, you, you're so busy with your portfolio. You're not looking at all the other matters as if you're serving in the portfolio. But, but these things didn't happen. So but thinking. these things didn't happen one day. Everything happened. These things happened over, 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 over a period of time. Over a period of time. And, 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 to, time. and to, like, you know, we... Look, uh, in a sense, the ANC has to take responsibility for that. They should have raised their voices. Nine, some of us had. Some nine, of us nine, had raised our voices. Nine wasted years. Do you agree with that? I, I wouldn't say completely, no. I, mean, I, I think there was good things. There was good things. There's good things happened. and bad things. And, and yeah. the people but who are I calling. But I think much, much more could have been achieved. And the people are claiming nice, nine wasted years. Many of them were there, including our current president, who was deputy yes, absolutely. president. I, I was there myself. <laughs> I was there myself. And I mean, if I look at the sector that I was attached to, I don't think that in education we had wasted years. And I can give you just three quick examples uh, of, of why it would not be wasted years. Uh, take the Eastern Cape. They stopped delivering textbooks to schools, stopped delivering stationery. Children were not being fed, right? And they couldn't manage their budget. Meeting was held, we had to make an intervention. 
Jacob Zuma says, Enda, says to me directly, you win, you go in, deal with the matter as a deputy minister. We went out there. Go to Eastern Cape now. Every child is fed. For the past 10 years, there was not a problem. Perhaps they have the best feeding scheme. Almost every school has utensils and a kitchen. And food is prepared by the, by the community for the children. No corruption. Communities own that particular process. Textbooks are delivered. We centralized procurement over there. Made sure that you don't have these Mickey Mouse guys who are doing it over there. Provincial pro procurement, thousands are being saved. The budget was sorted out and Eastern Cape now, and I can look back and say, well, you know, what we did as the foundation is now showing, has performed extremely well. I think they fourth or fifth, they used to be right at the bottom of the rung, rung of the letter. That's one example, all right. Feeding scheme, we, we in, in, increased the feeding scheme from 500, 000, 5 million to 9.2 million. Children being fed every day at school. It's statistics, it's numbers. 56 million books, word books, are being distributed to every child from grade R to grade 11, free of charge and on time. How did that happen? We had the Limpopo debacle. Remember? That was, that was early in the That was in the early, about in, 10. Early, uh, early, early in your 10 years as, as in, in, deputy minister. Well, but what did we do about it? We centralized the whole procurement of workbooks. We made sure that we are able to track every workbook. We can give you every, every account, and there's been no late delivery after that. 56 million books being delivered every year to every public child in a public school. I'm just giving examples. Mathematics, I mean, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you probably had 80,000 that passed mathematics. Mathematics is fundamental. You now have more than 250,000 passing mathematics and more than 100,000 passing you, above 60%. Are you happy with the fit with, with the low percentage pass? Uh, I'm, I'm very, pass targets? I'm, you, know, you know how we move incrementally when we started off, I mean, if I look at my, in my first 10 years with Enzi Mutsekha, when we started off, the bachelor's passes were at about 18%. It's now at about 43%. Bachelor's passes, 43% from 18%, is huge. So I'm not saying it's, it's, at, it's, it's, a, it's at the perfect position, but it has certainly improved considerably. One must take into account, and, and people tend to forget, People tend to forget. One must, oh, in, by the way, this is in Zuma's thing over here, just during, during his time. I know I was given the responsibility for infrastructure because things were not going right. And I even had the Deputy Minister of Finance because I told Praveen Gordon, who was the Minister of Finance, listen, you send your deputy to sit in the meetings where we call was up. Was that Nene? Nene? Yeah, Nene. yes. And he sat with me and we took off with the contractors and the lawyers. But wh 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 why is that we were able difficulty? to deliver, hold on, we were able to deliver 50 schools, no, uh, we, we were able to deliver 100 schools a year for two years in succession. Two schools a week. State-of-the-art schools. Now, I'm saying, was there non-delivery? Were we corrupt? Was any finger pointed? There was absolutely no sign of malfeasance politically in the Department of Education. Absolutely not. So now, can we basically take, carry the sins of, of, of Jacob Zuma and say, well, you know, this is it. I'm not saying that everything didn't go, everything went right. There was corruption in other portfolios, yes. But I invite anybody to say, during those 10 years that I was there, during the nine years of his time, show me point one finger of a, a, a corrupt tender within the national department of any malfeasance, and I'll say, well, look, okay, you're right. I, 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 I'm wrong. I want to stay on the, on the character of President Jacob Zuma. Uh, ANC will rule until, until Jesus comes. I remember that. Uh, and when I think of President Jacob Zuma, you know, I mean... Uh, and now I, you think about MK. <laughs> in, in a... Why did the ANC... So first of all, why was there such vengeance against President Jacob Zuma when he left? We, 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 get, we get the feeling... I mean, even people who are not part of the ANC, they sit and look back, you know, why, why, why do we have to go after him like that? It, it, it is... I'll, 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 you know, I, I think it's because these things happen, the, the corruption and malfeasance at the state. State capture occurred under his helm. I mean, you know, <laughs> the Guptas basically knew him, they associated with him, there's evidence to that effect, and, and that, 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 that created the anger. That was the anger, because on another level, on a personal level, I mean, you, you, you won't find a more polite and kind of guy. It's just really a wonderful person to chat with, and... and, and, and and I, I, you know, uh, he would not be, he never obstructed us 
in, in, in the work that we did. I mean, not, well, I don't know about my minister, but I can say me personally never told me, listen, don't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. Or go to the Guptas and organize a tender with them. He never did that. With me. I mean, al al although the, the, state, the State Capture Commission was initiated under President Jacob Zuma, it, if I'm not was, mistaken. Yes, it was. It was arising from the public protector's report, yes. But do, do you think the ANC and government could have, could have managed the Jacob Zuma I think we could have done better. Situation. We should have situation done better. We should, better. Have done, we should have done better. We I mean, done I'm not better. promoting the ANC in, in, in this line of questioning, but I'm just looking at the dynamics with the ANC in terms of what it has costed the ANC. No, it, it, we could have done better. There's no question about it. You know, corruption is corruption, malfeasance is malfeasance. You can't defend it under any circumstance, whether it's Jacob Zuma, whether it's Cerro Ramaphosa or Halima Mutlante, you know, so that's it, you know. So I'm, I'm not going to defend that. They, they, they were difficult years for us. Uh, we, we're seeing the results of those years now, you know, in the aftermath of it, you know. So you, you know, people must begin to understand, you are not in Transnet. You're not in Prasa. You're not, you know, you're not dealing with those matters. You've got this portfolio, you know, with, with 12 million children. Uh, and you, you're working on all those things. Those almost become, and you're not in cabinet. It's almost become side issues over there. You don't even know what's going on there. And you're not in those conversations. We were in the conversations with Tabo Mbeki. So I can give you an example how those conversations help. Because when the issue of early childhood development came up, there was no budget allocated to it. I raised the issue in cabinet. In, 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 in cabinet in, committee meetings. In, in Zuma? No, in, in, Tabo Mbeki, in Because business. we were invited to those meetings okay. at the time. So in the cabinet meeting, I raised it. And the instruction was given to Trevor Manuel there and then to say allocation must be made for it. And that was the seed money that started grade R, which is now in all our schools. Now Lady Ponder will tell you that. So we were able to do that. And obviously we do that with the backing of, of, of our ministers. And then Now Lady was just phenomenal insofar as that is concerned. That was something that's her brainchild, not mine. It's her brainchild and, and basically I, 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 I was her voice uh, in, in that meeting. Now, President Jacob Zuma started the MK party. Do, do, you, do, you, do you, as the ANC or as an ANC member, uh, with the insights that you have, do you, do you think that it's, it's, a, it's, is it a, is it a threat at, at any level, at a regional I level? Think, like I think it is a threat. He's a popular, he is, he is popular. And, and it's, it's a populist attempt at basically gaining votes, uh, clearly. It certainly, it, it goes against the spirit of the African National Congress. I can't speak too much about these issues mm. because I serve on the National Disciplinary Committee of the ANC. So uh, if, if a matter of this nature comes before me, then I don't want my, 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 my words to the, be quoted. But the, the, that was, uh, there was, a, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know if, I'm, if, if it was said within the ANC or something, but there was some talk that the Jacob Zuma issue would go to the, Discipline committee. I, I don't know because we don't make those decisions okay. the National Disciplinary Committee. The, the ANC decides. And is, is, they is, President team, still, is President they, Zuma still a member of the ANC or not? To my knowledge, he's not. Okay, he's been just, expelled just, just to, by the yeah. NEC. Because yes. that's, that's what I understood. So I, 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 I do not suspect, but I okay. don't know. So that's, okay, that's, it might well be that you may be suspended and, and the member who is who's a member of the ANC says to the NEC or to, 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 to the working committee, but listen, you know, that I, these statements that I've made are misunderstood. I'm not a member of MK and I would like to have a hearing. What do you do oh, under the circumstances? Okay. I, I don't know if that has happened. I don't know. Okay. I don't know, you, but I, I don't want to preempt. Uh, but I'm you, saying to you that, 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 that uh, when, we, when we deal with these matters here, as we deal with Carly House and deal with Isma Khashule, we have to be have open mind, you know, and you, uh, not be influenced by what the public says. Uh, so. You believe that Jacob Zuma, President Jacob Zuma, is a formidable force in terms of elections or a force? I, I, I think in KwaZulu Natal, he would, he would, he would probably draw uh, some support. Uh, I don't know how strong it would be, uh, but, but, but I mean, he has been president for a long time and he has been in the ANC for a long time. He's been the president of the African National Was Party. Was ANC shocked? when he started his MK party, you as someone who served under him and, and someone who knew him. Well, well I was surprised. Were you I was surprised? surprised. I was really surprised. I was really surprised that he did that. And I don't know, I, I never had an opportunity to speak to him and inquire what the, what the reason was for that. But I mean, I was disappointed and surprised, yes, I was. And as I've indicated, look, at the personal <laughs> level, we, we got along extremely well. I, mean. I, we, I get the feeling and I go back to you know the again irrespective of how you feel about the ANC and all of that you know the videos and I think my cameraman here 
he was in Nkandla when she, President Jacob Zuma was, was arrested. Uh, and, and he took some of that footage. It was very emotive footage, you know, watching him being arrested. Uh, yeah. th 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 it was very intense. And I think the whole, not I think, I know the whole country well, was, was watching. Well, there was a lot that was happening prior to his to, arrest. Yes, well. of course. That, know, that, a lot that, of voices that, 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 and so that, that, forth. They're up yeah. to that. And when you look at that, you, you kind of, you when I look at that, I'm not surprised. Look, I mean, Jacob Zuma is not a young man, you know, he's an old man. And I, and I don't even know why he's still in politics, you know, he should be retiring. You know? <laughs> Are you taking that line? I, 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 would, I, would, I would really think, I would really think that, you know, uh, he's, he's, he's old. I wouldn't want to go back uh, into politics here. I don't, I, I don't want to be a minister. I don't want to be anything. I don't have any political aspirations other than serving my organization and my country. I mean, that's basically it. How do you, how do you <coughs> assess and evaluate the, the, the position of Muslims and other ethnic minorities in South Africa today. Give, 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 given, I mean, you know, we, we, we have, and, and, I'll, and I'll put something on it. You have entities like the AFF going to the Constitutional Court to say, we want to say, kill the boor. Oh, we, we want to? To, to sing, oh, okay. kill the boor. I mean, with, and the question is not about the legality of that. It's a type of sentiment, you know. Uh, I, I was a few, uh, in, in December, Bougani, Bougani, Bougani Gema passed away. And I remember his... Oh, his, that song of his... You know, his, was, and I remember uh, that. Um, yeah. we, the, 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 this, this, the minorities and Muslims being part of them, uh, I won't say alarmed, but, but, but feel worried, you know. Uh, what, what, what is our future in this country? There, there, there are more and more uh, negative and uh, inflammatory conversations happening in social media yeah. uh, about African nationalism yeah. or what, whatever it may be. In, from, from, from the African National Congresses and from you such as someone who's been through history? Okay. Well, it's very easy for me to answer because, look, I, I mean, I, I could say the, the Muslims they have been respected all the time. Uh, they, uh, they've had the benefit of protection of their religious beliefs under the African National Congress. So if I was a member of the executive, it doesn't mean, if I'm no longer a member of the executive, it doesn't mean that the protection doesn't exist. I've left almost five years. No child with a beard has been expelled from school. No child wearing a pants has been expelled or a headscarf. Those, those values that we hold dear to us are still maintained and protected by the ANC. And that's for do 30 you think, years. Do you think they could, be they could go if other political parties oh, come yes. into Oh, yes. I mean, here's the evidence. Look at what happened in Cape Town. They, they, uh, they paint a Palestinian flag. And the city council, with the knowledge of their provincial government, basically decides to, to, to paint over it. So there is a visible, ostensible threat. But show me one threat, one instance where the ANC said there shouldn't be a van, or there shouldn't be a mosque, or you can't wear a headscarf. Nothing, nothing like that has ever emerged for 30 years. Now, if you get that kind of protection from a political party, you ought to be comfortable. You should be saying, and what do we do to improve on the weaknesses of that political party? What do we do to provide the kind of capacity that you're speaking about, the competence and the skills to ensure that we strengthen the party with people who have the skills and the integrity to be able to take it to another cause? It's, it, it's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge. It's a daunting challenge. But we have to do something about it, and we can't do it from the outside. What are, what are the... What are the to vote future here. challenges that you think South Africa will have as a I country? Think, I think it's a country, it's, it's, it's about collisions, the dangers and risk of collisions. You know, I've just finished like, in the first two, two and a half years of my so-called retirement, being in Lesotho. And the huge, the biggest problem in Lesotho was collisions, playing musical chairs, the elite occupying those positions. Today it's X, to me it's Y. So today it's going to be the EFF because But they, coalitions they, work in some parts of the world? West, they, West, they, West, they, West, they, Western they, Europe? They, they work marginally. But in South Africa, our context is very, very different. You know, if you take away the majority party that has such a strong sentiment and commitment to social cohesion, social cohesion, non-racialism, irrespective of the tendencies that may emerge within the organization, but it has that commitment that is unwavering and the freedoms of your religion and freedoms of your belief, whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim or a non-believer, it doesn't matter, the freedom of conscience, the respect for the constitution. Those things there are difficult to acquire. So for 30 years, it has not betrayed the constitution. Even when the odds were against them, even when the courts found against them, they complied. I mean, that's very interesting because the courts, 
they found against the ANC and against President Jacob Zuma on, on, on quite a few times. Yes, yes. Uh, in, 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 they did, in, in, they did. To support what you're saying in, on, in, yes. in, in, in honesty. Uh, and that's why, that is why you basically had the situation of the Zondo Commission. Because it was, uh, because the report of the public protector was that a commission should be established to do so. He couldn't do so as himself, he's the president. And, and, and an interesting part of, the, of, 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 of Judge Mokhweng Mokhweng is when he was appointed, there was a lot of opposition to his appointment. Because, there was, because there they was, said that he was. was in close proximity to President Zuma for something or some reason. And then later he, he found against President Zuma. Zuma. That was, I know. So people in the media, we, he, we do now, notice. Now Mukwing, Mukwing wants to become the next president of the country. He said so publicly. There's an inter two interviews. He says he's been ordained by God to be the next president of the country. And he says that with conviction. Like Jacob Zuma said, ANC will rule till Jesus comes. Yes, and, and you know what I told Jacob Zuma? Uh, you know, I, I, I beg to differ. My, my, my Jesus has come. So he says, what do you mean? I says, I have a grandson, his father's name is Muhammad, and his name is Isa, and Isa is Jesus, so my Jesus has come, you know. So we can, had a laugh about it. I can it. only imagine President Zuma. Yeah, no, he, he was laughing, la, la, he was la, just laughing. La, 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 know, la, yeah. uh, the, the future of Muslims and Islam, the Muslim community in South Africa, I mean, at the end of the day, we're also not monolithic. Yes. Uh, I, I, I think there might be, I might be reading it wrong, is the apathy in the political protest process? Do you see leadership amongst the Muslim community, youth community, whoever? Do you, do you, you see, I am glad you're raising this question. If you ask me about a concern, you know, you spoke earlier about the fact that Muslim population is two and a half million and will probably be five million if everybody's legalized uh, within the community, given the fact that, 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 you know, there's so many refugees from uh, Malawi, from Ethiopia, from uh, uh, Somalia. Uh, and, 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 other, and other parts of the world, Bangladesh, Pakistan included. Uh, uh, so, so that is the reality, that is the reality. And if you look at, if you go to the masjid, you, you find that is the reality, whether it's Fajr Salah or Isha Salah, you would find that the dominant group is not the indigenous Indian Muslim group. Uh, it, 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 it is mainly, so, so I put in inverted commas, uh, foreign group as it were. So, so that reality is there. Now, there is a feeling amongst many of the Indians to say, look, you know, we had so many people in parliament, we had so many people in the executive, we are all Muslims now. So they're concerned that they've been excluded. Now, how would this two and a half million Muslims feel if they are excluded from trusteeships, management, participation in governance of our mosque and our Islamic institutions? Would they be justified in saying, but hell, you know, we're Muslim, we have a right, just as, as you say, as a Muslim, you have a right as a citizen of this country to exercise your belief. They would say, don't we have similar rights in terms of our religious uh, uh, domain in, in that particular arena, his, his favorite word, uh, arena. Uh, so so the, 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 that, that is something that one has to look at very seriously, to see to what extent is assimilation and integration taking place amongst Muslims, irrespective of nationality, of ethnicity, of color, in our schools, in our madrasas, in our mosques, and, and, and broadly in, in our structures. Because that there would determine the future of the Muslim Ummah in this country. And if we're going to be insular and too comfortable, then we are not. We are missing a huge opportunity. What, what is your reading? Where are we going? Are we coming insular? Are we open? Are we? <sighs> what, what is what is your reading? I, I think it's mixed. Mixed. I think it's mixed. I, I think some people have indeed seen the reality and and, 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 and and are integrating and assimilating in a very very positive, concrete way. There are others who who just uh, oh. don't feel uh, that, 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 that any sense of attachment to the broader uh, community of Muslims. Do, and that's do, unfortunate. The, the, do you, I mean, of course, you, you're a member of the ANC, but there are Muslims who are joining the ranks of other political parties. There are Muslims in the DA, uh, there are Muslims in, the, in, in some of the new political parties that have been established. Uh, how, how do you feel about this? Do you think it's healthy for Muslims to be in? I'm asking to try to be objective because the other political it's, parties it's are hard, your opposition. You know, because I, I, obviously I would be partial and biased uh, because I'm a member of the African National Congress. But at the same time, I must be tolerant of the fact that there are members who are in the IFP and uh, 
who are in the DA and who are in other political parties in the EFF who are Muslim. Uh, do I stop speaking to them? No, I continue speaking to them. I develop a wonderful relationship with Butelezi and he had, a, he had a high respect for me and, and we got along extremely well. It doesn't mean that I'd forgotten where he came from. It means that he probably has recognized the value of our democracy, appreciated it, and, 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 and then without having seen saying so loudly, but privately said, look, man, you know, I might, might have erred. Let, let me go on a course and, and redeem myself in a way. So he basically took a good cause insofar as that is concerned. Unlike, you know, you've got Mohueng Mohueng basically, who basically is asked to apologize, and he says now in an interview, he's apologized because he's been ordered to do so, he respects the rule of law. But he hasn't basically retracted, nor has he said, listen, you know, I'm not going to condone this genocide. I'm fortunate. Uh, he doesn't speak about it. So I, I just think that you must have the courage and character to be in leadership. If you're going to ask me, would, 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 would I be comfortable? I get along, by the way, we are homeboys. We come from the same province, Mokweng, Mokweng and I. And we know each other long before I was a minister. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 so there is a relationship there. And, uh, but, but I just think he, he's missing one important dimension. And, and, and what we stand for as an organization uh, for a, creating a better Africa and a better world and our commitment to non-racialism and to, for the liberation of the oppressed people. Is, is you believe South Africa and Muslims are safe in the hands of the ANC? Absolutely. 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 I have absolutely no doubt about that. Yeah. Unless, unless the Muslim community begins to basically shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, you know, uh, there are ways in which you can do things and there are ways that that's, that's discipline. Now, so you, you have a present situation out here that's on social media. They say if schools will be closed by the ANC government. Now, where the hell do you get that from? Uh, madrasas will be closed. Uh, ANC is taking away the power from governing bodies. And now if you look at it closely, you say, but you know, all our Islamic schools, they don't even have governing bodies, they have trusts. So wh where does that come from, right? Then you say, then they say, uh, the Bella Bill talks about abortion and teenage pregnancy. It only has one statement to say that management of pregnant learners will be done by regulation. One sentence. Now, do Muslims basically have to say things that are not right? They can raise their concerns legitimately. And, 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 but, but to distort them in a way that creates confusion in the minds of the Muslims. And then those Muslims who are complacent, who don't even bother to read or to check, basically say, yes, 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 that's going to happen. So the same organization that's protected you, protected your mosque, protected your madrasa, protect, you know, if you go to parliament, if you are in the main restaurant, you can't, you don't, you're not going to be served liquor, intoxicants, because of Muslims, small minority of Muslims that are there. Salah time, if you are in plenary, you get up as a Muslim and you go to mosque. You don't need anybody's permission, not even the chief will permission. You go and perform his salah. Look at Ismail Vadi. How does he go to mosque? He goes, God, stop it. He's got his... Nobody looks a second time at the man. So you have all those freedoms. That came from the ANC. You go to your airports. You've got facilities. Who, who created those facilities? Not the DA, not anybody else. It was driven by the ANC. Now, you forget all those things suddenly. Your memory becomes short. And you probably, if, we, if you have another political party, might say, look, you know, if we've, we've, we've monitored the, the use of the Salah facilities in the airport, it's wasted space out there, not enough people in attendance, and for functional reasons, we're closing it. There. That's going to be the result. The ANC is not going to do that. But you come to a situation where you have another party in thing, I can't, I, I, I certainly won't feel comfortable, especially after seeing what the city of council of Cape Town had done in terms of basically painting over a flag which represents the struggle of our people as in under an apartheid regime and our solidarity and identity with oppressed people who are Muslims in Palestine and our commitment from the ANC from the beginning from Nelson Mandela from right from the beginning and now you allow that to you you do that in the face of that particular history and legacy, no ways. I'm not going to trust my future or the destiny of my children with a party that basically is imperialist and wants to colonize us in a very clever way. That's what's going to happen. There's an attempt to colonize the black people of this country. And if our Muslims don't wake up, that is going to be the reality of tomorrow.
thank you for that. Uh, before we end, uh, you are 71. 70, 70. You're 70 now, 71. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I, I, Soon to be 71. To 71, inshallah. Allah like, so will give you a long life. Inshallah. Allah. What has life taught you? Well, life has taught me that three things importantly, maybe 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 a few more. But firstly, that you are not the creator of your destiny. That your plan, your, your, the creator of your plans comes from elsewhere. Your taqdeer is, is, is determined elsewhere. Uh, I never knew where I'm going to be. I never knew that I was going to leave to become a politician. I never knew that I was going to become a minister. It wasn't in my plans of life. It just happened accidentally. And I thank Allah for it. And I thank the people for the support that they provided me during that time. So that would be my first uh, thing. But it doesn't mean that if it indeed you are, if your life goes in a particular direction, that you must stop working and assume that everything is going to come because the Quran says very clearly uh, that, that, that you, 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 you create your own destiny, as it were. Uh, you, you create your own future. So that freedom that you have as, as, as a human being is something that you must use, uh, harness. The, the second takeaway is all that I've achieved in life would have not been possible for, but for the women in my life. My wife, who basically looked after my children for more than 25 years while I was away and carried on with her political work and her own work. And, and that's an enormous sacrifice for a woman who's alone. And she was alone. There was nobody else, no extended family out there looking after the children, seeing them to school, seeing after the madrasa, seeing to the extramural, being a speaker in a and being a chairperson of the government, chairperson of the branch secretary, enormous. I, I, I really think she would deserve a greater credit, and my mom, of course, and all the other women who have pre provided support for me, Naledi Pandu, Enji Mutsekha, wonderful people, I mean, and I had just great, great pleasure in, in serving under them and with them. So, so, so that would be simply acknowledging the role of women uh, in my life. The third is really to be, be, be very, very grateful and grat express your gratitude to all the people who have influenced you in one way. My organization, the ANC, for developing me, developing certain political talents, which I would otherwise not have acquired. The people who influenced me and almost compelled me to join, to go into parliament and to ensure that I too make a contribution. I thank them and, and for the ANC giving me the opportunity. From, the, from our current president, uh, Salah Ramaphosa, he, he opened many doors in terms of allowing me to raise points and develop the confidence to be able to argue for the ANC when I was still a very young man. Uh, that, 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 that is useful. And, and the other presidents. Um, I must say Jacob Zuma was, was good to me personally, very, very good for, for education. has been one, wonderful. Uh, Khalema Mutlante was quite unique, Tabu Mbeki. So it's, it's many people politically and then all my friends and, and people that have supported me. Here's a friend here sitting out here with me. We were in school together. That's 1968, 1969, 1970. Three years together, best of friends, still there. The only different difficulty is I wish I had more <laughs> courage to wear a beard as long as he has. But uh, Alhamdulillah, so that, 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 that has been great. And perhaps the last thing is, is really to recognize that whatever limited uh, endowments you have in life, I mean, you thank Allah for it, uh, but shouldn't make you arrogant and proud, but should make you humble and grateful. So it's with an expression of gratitude that we basically carry on with our journey in life. We haven't stopped working. We will continue, inshallah, if we have the strength. But to really say, and, and the last, the last, is people see Enver Suti on television, they hear him on radio, they hear him in seeming debates, and they may or might read his books. But I have so, so many weaknesses. So many weaknesses that uh, I feel that I don't deserve the accolades, the praise, the support. And then and, and I just hope uh, I'm forgiven for all the limitations and any harm that I might have caused anybody. I mean, sure, I mean, sure. Before we go, the camera is yours for one minute. To Channel Islam International listeners, to South African viewers and listeners, you can say anything, you can, com you can campaign for the ANC, you can say thank you to your wife, you can, you can say whatever well, you want to say. Well, it's, I, it's yours. I have said thank you for my wife already, and, and, and indeed I will thank her again for, for, for the wonderful support, extraordinary support and, uh, uh, she has provided, and to my mom, obviously, and, and my sisters, my siblings, and, and every, all the women in, in, in my life, there are too many of them. Uh, but I would like to say that the community must think about whom they're going to vote for. The ANC has a record of protecting the rights and freedoms of Muslims. 
It has supported the poor and will continue to do so. It does so in terms of its support grants. And I'll just give you an example in education. To feed 9,2 million children every day, to provide 56 million books free of charge, and to have more than 85% of our children in free education, and to show gradually and incrementally an improvement in the quality of education. This is important. So not everything is bad. There are weaknesses, and indeed they have to be corrected. But to, to encourage our people to be make sure that political life, Muslims, and I stress Muslims, that the political life is not divorced from their mundane activities, and, and that's very, very critical. And, 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 and to, to vote, even if they don't vote for the ANC, I would certainly vote for the ANC, but to be very, very clear and frank about if they vote for the ANC, to say, look, I'm not happy with this, I wish to express my disappointment in that, and this is how we can correct it, and to make themselves available to improve the future and the destiny of the poorest of the poor in this country. After all, this is what it's all about. It's our, our commitment to creating a non-racial, non sexist equal society and, 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 and our commitment to equality, founding, uh, founding value in our constitution, human dignity, equality, and freedom. Now think about the Palestinian struggle and think about how powerful those three values that underpin our constitution are. Human dignity, because they're being stripped of the dignity in everything that the, 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 the Zionists are doing. Equality, they've been denying that, denied that, it's an apartheid state. And freedom, it's been curtailed in an open concentration camp. So those three values that underpin our constitution are values that we should embrace as Muslims. And inshallah, we have a good future, not to be afraid, but to say, well, opportunities uh, abound, and not everything is going to go our way. But there's no reason why we shouldn't fight for what is right and what is just and what is true. Thank, Thank you. you. That was our conversation with Enver Surti. Jazakallah khair for being just Thank amazing you. and, and, and open and frank with us. Jazakallah khair. Shukran to you. Shukran. Alaikum. Wa alaikum Shukran to you. In Conversation With is proudly sponsored by Africa Cash and Carry, Crown Mines, and shot on location at Kurtuba Convention Center.